Welcome to worship on this, the third Sunday in the season of Easter. And thanks to the Revelation Praise Band for inviting us into worship with the acknowledgement that our God saves. A couple of announcements as we go to worship. A word of welcome to those who are visiting with us. It's always nice to have visitors, and we like to say here at Messiah, if you're visiting with us and you don't have a home church, we'd like for you to make Messiah your home. We're so serious that we've provided three ways for you to make that happen. That is, you can talk with me. If you're scared of me, then talk to a shepherd. You shouldn't be, but just in case. And, uh, and if you're scared of the shepherds, then you can call the church office and they're nice people in the church office. I'm in there too, but um, you can talk to someone in the church office and we we'll make that happen for you. It's always nice to receive and grow our family and we'd love for you to be a part of the Messiah family. I'm gonna ask Scott to make an announcement since we're talking announcements. Thank you much. Just wanted to uh, extend We've already given you the welcome. We're extending that welcome to everybody. To, to, we want you to know that you know we're up here playing. We're not just we're not here just to listen to a band. We want we're just leading worship. We're leading you, and when you, the words are up above, we want you to be singing along with us. If you don't want to sing, you can clap. You can stomp your feet. You can do whatever you'd like to do. But we want you to lift up your voices to the Lord, and um, and that's what it's all about. And uh, we're doing the songs like three, four times in a row so you can learn them, because I know some of the songs are not going to be familiar to you. They weren't familiar to me, for sure. And please don't worry about making a mistake in the, because you're not singing the right note, because clearly I make so many mistakes up here, it's not even funny. So please, we just want you to do whatever and, and join us in, in praising the Lord. Thank you, Scott. Now that we have that invitation to sing and dance and jump and clap and so on, uh, I know you were talking to Lutherans, so you have to be understanding that sometimes the Spirit moves us slowly, okay? All right, just letting you know, okay. 
Uh, Sunday school confirmation class uh, and adult class meets after worship. Confirmation class, you're meeting with me today because Chuck is out and uh, Dennis is out. So you get to meet with me. Uh, we'll meet in the usual place at the usual time. And uh, today is Teachers Recognition Sunday. So in the liturgy, very early in the liturgy, we are invited into that acknowledgement with a litany uh, of prayer for teachers. Yeah, last evening we had a wonderful dinner in the fellowship hall for the teachers and I got to be a part of that, so I, I had a good time. And I want to say a word of thanks to Susie Rucker and Jim Rucker and um, April Gepkin. Uh, these are the people who prepared the meal, uh, really did a nice um, work of decorating and uh, we had a great time, so thanks. You would have noticed if you have received your spirit for the month of May that we are moving beyond just prayers for the people of Ukraine. We are acknowledging that Ukrainians, Ukrainian refugees are arriving in our area, and as a result of that, um, we want to do more than just pray for their situation. So we're inviting you to help relieve the suffering, help the transition of people who are arriving into the area. And we're doing that in a variety of ways. When you read the article, it suggests ways in which you can be of assistance to these people. In particular, we have prepared envelopes that are labeled Ukrainian or Ukraine Refugee Assistance, or fund rather, fund. And whatever you put in that envelope, we will make that monies, that those monies available uh, to those people who are arriving. We're working in collaboration with Bread of Life, which is a, a, a Slavic congregation in Rogersville that is kind of spearheading this effort as well as we're working with a church right in our neighborhood that we are sister, sister churches in the Seminole Holland area, Bethany Evangelical uh, Church, which is a Ukrainian church. We're working through these bodies because they have the language which we don't have, and they have the access that we might not have. And so this is our way of reaching out and showing our support beyond the prayers that we lift up. So we encourage you to give in whatever way you can. We've put names in the article that you can call. So if you have items that are in, we like to say it this way. If you don't want it, and you don't want it because it's broken or it's of no use, don't give it gently used, repurposing, yes, call those persons that we have listed there or provided emails for, and you arrange to take those items to them because we don't want to be a holding house for big items that we can't store here. So that's just a way of encouraging you to think about what you can give and how you can be of help in this time of need. This week, uh, Springfield Prayer Breakfast in observance of the National Day of Prayer is on Thursday, May the 5th, and several of us are planning to attend that event at the Oasis Convention Center from 7 o'clock in the morning. You can still be a part of it if you want. Um, it's a $15 event, and... Uh, good speaker, good food, and good networking. Most of all, lifting up the prayers for the community before God. And then in our prayers today, we want to continue in our prayers for Ukrainians who are suffering, who feel trapped or injured, who are grieving their loss and defending their freedom and nationhood. We want to pray for Beth Melgren, dealing with difficult diagnosis. We're praying for Stephanie Jones, sister of Sandra Carlson, uh, older sister of Sandra Carl Carlson, who is nearing the end of life. 
We're praying also for Bob White, who's dealing with health issues, for Duke, brother-in-law of Tom Wishwell, who has cancer and is going to go on chemo, and we're praying for others who are privately dealing with health crises. You might not know, but they are. Uh, we also lift up the family of Chris West, who passed in a vehicular accident this week. These are, Chris West is a neighbor of uh, Bonnie Luther and Tom Wishwell, a uh, young guy who has a three-month-old child and died very tragically this past week in an accident. So we're lifting them up in our prayers. These are all the announcements that I have. I invite you to stand as you're able. In celebration of our baptism in Christ, we worship God in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Jesus was a great teacher. Rabbi means teacher. Jesus taught using a variety of methods by writing in the sand. Jesus led by example. Jesus told vivid stories about finding lost coins, lost sheep, and lost sons. Jesus taught by examples that were familiar about sheep and shepherds, seeds, vines, bread and wine. Jesus took time away from the crowds to pray, to be with friends, to be refreshed and renewed. Jesus challenged his hearers to commitment. Turn the other cheek. Follow me. Jesus fulfilled his purpose to reveal God's love and to help us remember, help us respond rather to God's love. Thanks be to God for Jesus, teacher, Lord, and Savior. Amen. Amen.
the Lord be with you. Eternal and all merciful God, with all the angels and all the saints, we laud your majesty and might. By the resurrection of your Son, show yourself to us and inspire us to follow Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated as we prepare our hearts for confession. God of all people, with the whole of creation, make us into what you have created us to be. Make us your hands, your feet, your eyes, your lips, your body in the world. Spirit of peace, reconcile us. Connect us to yourself, to each other. You are the source of our healing and hope. For if one is hurt, all of us are hurt. Clothe us, your body in the world, with your love, mercy, and grace. Amen. The promise rests on grace. By the saving love of Jesus Christ, the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. May this rich promise embrace us all, taking away the pain of our battered bodies and inviting us all to face who we are as children of God. Amen. Oh, 
The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the 21st chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. After he appeared to his followers in Jerusalem, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together with Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples, Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We will go with you. They went out and got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, No. He said to them, Cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because it was, there were so many fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the full net of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore, full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This is now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Then he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to, them, feed, to him, Feed my lambs. The second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will fasten the belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he would glorify God. And this he said to him, follow me, the gospel of the Lord. Praise to you. Kind of looking for the children, but they seem to be like uh, the fish during the night when the disciples were trying to catch fish and the, there was nothing to be found. But since I've prepared a children's message, I'm going to give it to you because all of us are children, aren't we? So today I want to talk to the kids about friendship. And I want to ask the question, how do we choose our friends? How do we choose our friends? Now, 
You will hear me read in a little while from Acts of the Apostles the story about Saul and how he became a Christian. And when you hear the story, listen carefully to what is being said, because in the story, Jesus sent a man by the name of Ananias to befriend a bully. And Ananias was scared, like those of us who were in school and who are still in school, when we come up against a bully, we get scared, okay? He knew, Ananias knew, that Saul was an evil man. In fact, he says that, was an evil man. But Ananias trusted God, Jesus, and when he was sent to meet Saul, while he was scared, he did something remarkable. He addressed the bully with these words, Brother Saul. That's what he calls him, called him, brother. Now, I've never heard that happen at school, and I never did that at school. Or if I were a bully, nobody called me Brother Oren. But here it is, called him brother. And, that, and on that day, Saul saw followers of Jesus in a different way. Saw them as loving, saw them as forgiving. And he joined them in sharing the precious love and forgiveness that Jesus gives to all people. So, Jesus says, the way to make the enemy a friend is to love them. Let us pray. Dear God, we are blessed to be loved and forgiven through Jesus Christ. Help us to daily make friends by sharing his love and forgiveness with others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So I'm going to tell you now that um, uh, for the next several Sundays leading up to Pentecost, I'm going to be preaching from Acts of the Apostles. So if you get the readings, you want to pay attention to the readings from Acts of the Apostles. If you have your phone with you, you might want to turn to Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. You might want to open it to Acts of the Apostles chapter 9. It's a substantial bit of reading, but it's a reading that you might be familiar with. It's Acts of the Apostles, chapter 9, verse 1 to 20. Now, here goes the reading. Saul, still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus, so that if he found any who belonged to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he was going along and approaching Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground, and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? He asked, Who are you, Lord? The reply came, I am Jesus, whom you're persecuting. But get up and enter the city and you will be told what you are to do. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless because they heard the voice but saw no one. Saul got up from the ground, and though his eyes were opened, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. For three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. Now there was a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, he answered, 
Here I am, Lord. The Lord said to him, Get up and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. At this moment he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he is authority from the chief priests to bind all who invoke your name. But the Lord said to him, Go, for he is an instrument whom I have chosen to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. I myself will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias went and entered the house. He laid his hands on Saul and said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on your way here, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and his sight was restored. Then he got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. For several days, he was with the disciples in Damascus, and immediately he began to proclaim Jesus in the synagogues, saying, He is the Son of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So next Sunday, we'll read again from Acts of the Apostles. We'll be in the same chapter. We'll be reading verse 36 through 43, and we'll be looking at the raising of Tabitha. Today, it's this story about Saul. It is said that some people only change when they feel the heat. I know that's been true for me. Some people only change when they feel the heat. Mom says, get the, the switch. And you know it's going to be painful. Some people only change when they feel the heat. Now, every one of you know, know Paul, right? Yeah, we know him as Paul. We've met Paul at school. We've met Paul at community events. We've even met Paul on the plane if we're traveling. We've met Paul in parks. We've met Paul in neighborhoods. Yes, he is the guy who knows everything. And... Even if he doesn't know everything, he behaves as though he knows everything. Mind you, he could be a nice guy to those that he likes. But then, there are many others that he does not like, and he's not afraid to show it. Those individuals become his targets for humiliation. Paul was a bully. He made it his personal duty to persecute followers of Jesus Christ. All followers of Jesus knew about Paul, and those who met him did not live to tell of their experience. One such is Stephen, the first martyr, Christian martyr, who appears in Acts chapter 7. 
Paul didn't have to throw the stones, but Paul was the one who saw to it that the execution was carried out. For those who threw stones at Stephen, it is said, laid their coats at the feet of Saul. That is the story leading up to Paul's change. Notice I'm using the word change. And I'm intentionally using the word change instead of the word conversion because conversion is understood by many to mean something that we do, someone does. We say of converts that he or she has given their life to Jesus. Well, I'm not using the word conversion because what I see here is that Paul changed. Changed when he encountered the risen Christ. And he changed because he was called. Here is what Acts of the Apostles chapter 9 and verse 15 says, I have chosen him to bring my name before Gentiles and kings and before the people of Israel. So the first surprise was Paul's vision of the risen Christ. We are still experiencing the resurrection to this very day. The risen Christ still shows up in our lives. And here it is that Paul receives a vision of the risen Christ, and then... After he sees the risen Christ, he cannot see. He's blinded. The second surprise was Ananias. Ananias could not believe that he was asked to go and see Saul, meet with Saul, Paul. Hear what he tells the Lord. He pushes back. Many of us do the same thing. It's not unusual. Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil, notice the word, how much evil he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And here he has authority to bind all who invoke your name. Ananias would prefer not to deal with Saul, Paul. Ananias felt that this was a cruel joke, but it wasn't a joke. Paul was called to be a servant of the gospel, and Ananias had a part to play in that because Ananias needed to validate that call for Saul, Paul. And how do you validate such a call? In the words of Scripture, we do it always by laying on of hands. Laying on his hands on Paul, and he received his sight. He laid his hands on him, and he received the Holy Spirit. Now, Easter is not what we do, but what the risen Christ did and continues to do in, with, and through his followers. Saul of Tarsus was a Hebrew. He was of Hebrew parentage. He belonged to the tribe of Benjamin. He was circumcised on the eighth day, and he observed the Pharisaic law. It is generally believed that Paul changed his name when he became a Christian, but that's not true. Let's correct the record here. That's not true. Saul began using his Latin name, Paul. He didn't take a new name. That was always his name. We might say he was using his middle name, so to speak. Right? Some people do that. 
I know my wife's um, father used his middle name. His name was Samuel Roy, but he used Roy. Saul began using his Latin name Paul in his ministry to the Gentiles, and I think it's strategic because here he was as a Roman citizen who has become a Christian missionary. Why use Saul, which limits his access in the Roman Empire. He used Paul because as a Roman citizen, he had rights and privileges. He had the freedom to take the gospel throughout the Roman Empire. And hence, he's using his Latin name, Paul. Change. Not conversion in the sense that we think of it. You know, change happens to all of us. There are some things that happen in our lives that we can't do anything about, like growing old. Every time I see a new gray hair, I try to pull it out, and what happens? More show up. And after a while, you have to kind of just let it be. It's not a bad thing. And, and then, you know, my grandmother used to give us consolation. She would say, you know, gray hair is a sign of wisdom. Well, what she probably meant is experience, right? You've gone through life. Change. It happens to all of us. And some things are out of our control. Change is also forced. As you notice, Saul was going to Damascus to force those who were Jews who met in the synagogue to desist from using Jesus' name and to practice their Judaism. Okay? So, change can come about by force, or change can come by by education. I hear debates all the time in society, and sometimes what I do hear is that there is an unwillingness for education to be a part of our culture in such a way that we learn from our history. We learn about our past. We don't feel embarrassed by our past, but we embrace our past as something that has happened, not with our sanctioning, but nevertheless has occurred. And we learn in such a way that we do not allow it to happen again. Change. Forced or by education. Change sometimes evoke fear, excitement, and dread. And in this case with Saul, what we see here is that he is called to be a follower of Jesus Christ, to walk with Christ, to speak the gospel and live it in his daily life. And what does Jesus call that change? Anybody knows what Jesus calls that change? Come on, Lutherans. What does Jesus call that change? He calls it I know you're not Baptist or you're not evangelical, but he calls it born again. John chapter 3 tells Nicodemus, you must be born again. And where do you get this birth from? He says you get it from above. So what changed for Paul was the way he saw and responded to Jesus Christ. You see, prior to this, Paul did not like Jesus. Bullies did just choose people that they don't like, right? To him, Jesus was dead, and he wanted Jesus to remain dead. So he sought to silence those who said that Jesus was alive. And to this day, that still happens. For Paul, 
there was only one God. We must understand why Paul is acting this way. For Paul, there was only one God, and Jesus was not God. See how religion sometimes can bring about sin? We sometimes think that we are Christians, so we're perfect. Come on. We're Lutherans, so we're perfect. Come on. There's not such, no such thing as perfection. Not on this side of eternity. Paul is operating out of a Jewish mindset because he believed in his heart that he was following the law of God, which forbid idolatry. Isaiah chapter 42 and verse 8. I alone am the Lord your God. No other God may share my glory. I will not let idols share my praise. Paul knew his people's sins. They worshipped the golden calf in the wilderness. They worshipped Baal, remember, under uh, the leadership of King Ahab and Queen Jezebel when Elijah challenged them in 1 Kings 18. People have other gods when they regard and worship any creature or thing as God. And Paul sought to put an end to idolatrous practices. But... People continue to be idolatrous to this very day. For instance, the rich man who think more of his clothing and good eating than God was idolatrous. Like the people in the Old Testament times, we build our Tower of Babel and we think to ourselves, that we have arrived, that we are, we are more important than God. Like Goliath, we trust our physical strength and our resources for security rather than trust in God. Thank you for that endorsement, Gwen. <laughs> and like Eli... We honor our children more than God when we bless them. In fact, when we behave as though they are more precious than any other person or being in the world. When in fact, God has blessed us to have kids. And like Paul, we harass others by our self-righteous attitudes and our practices. So the scales must fall so that we might see the neighbor as a human being for whom Christ died. God wants us to live well. Notice, I tell my congregation that God does not expect us to be perfect. That is not realistic. But God expects us to be faithful, to live well. Genesis chapter 17 and verse 1. To walk before God and be blameless. We do so when we love God above all things and our approach in life is living, is life giving to others. I began by telling you that some people only change when they feel the heat. That is true, but I believe in my heart, and I hope you do too, that change is best appropriated when we see the light. When we see the light. And on that note, I want to end with this little song 
that we sang in Sunday school. I think some of you might know it. Jesus bids us shine with a clear, pure light, like a little candle burning in the night. In this world of darkness, so we must shine. You in your small corner, and I in mine. Shine your light, the light that has come within us through the resurrected Christ for the sake of the world. Amen. Please stand as you are able and join us in song.
join me in confessing our faith in the triune God with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered on the Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. With a chosen symbol, share the peace of God with each other. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Share the peace with each other. fill us with new life and send us like Paul to invite people to follow Christ and care for creation, especially plant and animal life that purifies air and water for all living creatures. Give to all who labor the courage to demand fair treatment and just wages that all might live with dignity. Look with compassion on Ukrainians. Give them courage to defend their sovereignty and move us to help relieve their suffering through concrete acts of kindness. Restore all people who cry to you for help, especially Stephanie, Bob, Duke, James, Dawn, Beth, Becky, Meg, Charlie, Rees, Dan, Hope, and Joanne. In your mercy, turn their mourning into dancing. Clothe them with joy and put a testimony of healing on their lips that together with angels, creatures, and all the saints, we might praise and reveal God's love and glory through worship and service in Christ's name. We transition now from the spoken word to the embodied word. And as we come with the table in our sight in anticipation of receiving Christ who is present in this bread and in this cup, 
we bring our gifts, the gift of ourselves and the gift of our offerings. We place them in the plate at the back of the sanctuary on entry and exit, acknowledging that what we put therein is an expression of our love for the one who gives us life. Today we also acknowledge in our, gift, in our midst the gifts that we bring that cannot be contained in a plate, but nevertheless we lift up with gratitude the gift of Grant Hudson as our acolyte, the gift of the praise band in leading us in worship, the gift of Jenny Marac as our lecturer, the gift of our AV techs in Morgan Benedict and Drew Bowman and Kelly, and the gift of our shepherds in Bill Roark, Jeannie Barty, and Sydney Marsh. I think I might be missing somebody. And uh, as we come now to the table, we acknowledge also the gifts of the altar guild in preparing this table for us, preparing worship, preparing us for worship by preparing the table, laying it out for us with diligence and care and a love for the one who gives himself to us. Ably assisted by the floral committee who, with beautiful floral arrangements and symbols from the reading, invite us to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so we hear now the words of institution. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take and eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup of wine, and when he had given thanks, he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood that is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do it for the remembrance of me. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. The risen Christ dwells among us here. All who are hungry, all who are thirsty, come.
Please stand with me as you're able. The body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, strengthen and keep us unto life eternal. Amen. We give you thanks, generous God, for in this bread and cup we have tasted the new heaven and earth, where hunger and thirst are no more. Send us from this table as witnesses to the resurrection, through that through our lives all may know life in Jesus' name. Amen. God, the author of life, Christ, the living cornerstone, and the life-giving spirit of adoption, bless you now and always. Amen. Hallelujah! Christ is risen! Go in peace. Tell what God has done.